Hey ladies, I hope that this finds you well. Um, I don't know about where you're at, but uh, the state that I'm in, there are greater restrictions being placed sort of slowly. So I anticipate another shutdown um, and I'm not looking forward to it, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, I had a couple questions after last week's video and they were really good questions and things that are clearly on people's minds. So I wanted to um, answer them. So the first one was about how to die to self in a world full of selfish and demanding people. Um, and that's a battle that I think we all fight because um, there is an element of people taking advantage of others or manipulating others. Um, and definitely when you are somebody who's willing to serve and who offers or gives a lot, there are people in this world who will just take and take and take. Um, and knowing how and when to serve people when we have limited energy and resources and time is really important. Dying to self, I talked about uh, last week, it means humility and means prioritizing others. But there's a lot of others in our lives. So um, to me, when I read this question, um, I remembered uh, about 13 years ago, 12 or 13 years ago in my life, um, when I was in a good place with God, I'd been transformed. I was uh, surrendered and, and in his word every day. I had a new baby and I was trying to figure out how to balance all of the different demands on my time. I was actually asking really this exact question, just in different words. I was asking God to show me how to uh, understand whether I can say no, whether I should say no. Did serving just mean whatever opportunity was put in front of me, I should do it? Um, what about when I had multiple opportunities to help others and they conflicted? Who should I choose? Um, you know, how much did serving my family count? You know, this sort of thing. And I'll tell you, growing up in a ministry home, my parents were in full-time ministry and still are uh, my whole life. And I have seen the good and the bad of people who are dedicated uh, to serving. And I've seen the traps that we can fall into as adults, where uh, serving God can be used as a reason to um, ignore problems in our family, or to choose ministry over what might be more mundane or more difficult tasks. Um, putting God's name to something does not mean it honors God. I just want to put that to you, but I'll get into it more. So how do we die to self? How do we balance serving when people are very demanding or selfish or we have conflicting uh, needs in, in different people or different groups in our lives? So the first thing that, that God showed me through his word was that he prioritizes the relationships in our lives. Uh, first and foremost is our relationship with him. But obviously, serving other people is part of our relationship with God. So just like I shouldn't uh, use ministry as an excuse not to do something else I don't want to do, I also shouldn't use time with God as an excuse not to develop a relationship with somebody else. Uh, but there are ways and means and times to prioritize being with God. If you want to see the balance of that in Christ's life, a really good uh, passage is in Mark 6 from uh, verse 30, because what you see happen there is that he and the disciples have been serving. They have been very busy. He's being flocked by people. Um, and his response to that is to gather the disciples up and say, let's go rest somewhere. But while they are going, while they are on their way, the crowd shows up and it says that Christ takes compassion on them. So he 
uh, puts aside his desire for rest and, uh, and, and teaches. But the thing that I find really interesting about that story, if you keep reading, is that even though he changes his plan to rest, at the end of that time, he sends the disciples on and he still goes and takes some time alone with God. Uh, and some fun stuff happens at the end of that, but I'll, I'll send you to read it. But my point is that you, you see in that, that there are times, there's definitely times when we think, oh, now I get some time off or now I'm going to rest, or this is my moment to just be quiet, uh, with God and, and, and take some, take some time. And the Lord will bring opportunities into that at times that we should then postpone our own rest to serve somebody else. Um, but it's not a replacement. If I need to postpone my own rest to serve somebody else, that shouldn't mean that I don't rest at all. It should mean that my rest also gets postponed. So how do we prioritize uh, the example of rest, the rest that Christ tells us he will give us, and the relationships and all of the different demands that get placed on us? Well, God gives us a very clear structure of the relationships in our lives. First and foremost, if we are married, our spouse is the other half of us. And next to God, the spouse is the first and foremost priority. If you want to see that, uh, it gets established in Genesis 2. Um, and then it gets reiterated in Matthew 19 and Ephesians 5. The spouse is first. And, and the thing that's interesting to me when you read those passages with that priority in mind is that you see that God says you're leaving your family for this person. So that immediately tells us that the family becomes second to the spouse. So I'll tell you this from experience. If you are newly married, there are many, many families and many, many people who, when they become newly married, they struggle with how do I prioritize, you know, they still go to their parents for advice. Their, their parents are still involved in their lives. They're still uh, in a relationship with them. If, if in your marriage relationship, there is conflict between your spouse and your family, I would tell you that these verses indicate that you should prioritize your spouse. Does that mean you cut off your family? No, of course not. God doesn't tell you to do that. But when it's a matter of balancing whose needs are more important, your spouse's needs should be placed in priority over your family. So then we get into children and family, right? Parents, brothers and sisters, our children, all of the people that we've been given, um, God-given relationship with, people that you cannot separate from even if you are separated from them um read proverbs 31 if you want to see how the woman um the godly woman is described as balancing her children and her husband because i do think unfortunately because we because our children arrive with such dependence on us the temptation can be to fall into child becoming more important than the spouse. And that is not borne out in scripture. Yes, obviously, when children have physical needs that they cannot uh, provide for themselves, yes, of course, parents need to provide that in priority over an adult who can feed themselves or clothe themselves or whatever. I'm not suggesting that your child gets neglected so that your husband gets his coffee. I'm saying that when it comes to conflicting needs of equal um, 
you know, my son wants to play a game with me and my husband wants me to do something else with him. Unless there's been an imbalance already, if I have to choose, then my priority should go to my husband because the likelihood is I've already been spending a lot of time with my son and I haven't been seeing as much of my husband. So I'm not suggesting, let's be clear, this is about balance. This is about God's uh, priorities. That doesn't mean you abandon the child to, to, to fulfill the whim of the husband. It means that where the needs are equal, one should be prioritized over the other. Um, and if you want to see that in 1 Timothy 5, 8 and in Mark 7, 10 and 11, uh, we're told that, that the family is, is top rung in terms of when you compare. And this is a challenging one, especially for ministry families. When you look at your family versus the world or even the church, your family should take priority. That's 1 Timothy 5, 8. And Mark 7, 10 to 11, the needs of your family are more important in God's eyes than the needs of anybody else. These are, and this is where I think people get off base, your family is the ministry God literally created you into. The sister you're estranged from, the cousin you can't stop fighting with the mother who is rough or the father who is hard. In God's eyes, those relationships, the ministry that you can bring, the light that you can bring is more important there than the church or the school or the neighbor. And that's a hard one for people because families have hurt us. We've had more time with them. They know us better. We know them better. We see their flaws and they see ours. And we can have a tendency because the reality is even if ministering at church, and when I say ministering, I just mean serving, serving at church, serving at the school, whatever. It's easier. Even if it's not fun, it's easier because the emotional impact is less. And I know a lot of ministry families, a lot of ministry parents who have children in dire need of relationship and um, investment. And those needs do not get priority over the sermon or the Bible study or the woman's group. And I'm sorry, I do not see, I do not see that anywhere in God's word. If a child is born to you, if a brother or sister, you were born into the same family, this is, or, 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 or even adopted into the same family, this is the family God has given you. If you cannot be light to them, you can't be light to anybody. And I'll tell you, it's way more rewarding to walk out the door to people who don't get to see you in your ugly moments and don't get to see you in your weakness. You can look way better to those people and they can be way more impressed with you. Even Christ said the prophet is not respected in his hometown. The reality is the better people know us, the less respect or less um, adulation they have for us. So it's easy to tell ourselves that the work or ministry outside of the home should be more important because maybe there's more people involved or maybe it's a calling but I can tell you that the first calling God gave you was to your spouse the second one was to your children and your family and the third is to anyone who's related to you Who's, who, who he has brought into your life by, by virtue of birth. Your family's needs should come first. 
And if you are in formal ministry or paid ministry or any type of ministry, if you are doing quote unquote God's work for people who don't hold that position, find another way to do the work you're doing because those people are leading you out of God's will. So then what about the difference between work for the church, work being service, Service for the church versus service to the world. Um, Mark 7, 27 talks about that. We should prioritize our spiritual family over the needs. So this is in terms of physical needs. If I have one $50 voucher to give away, if there is a family in need in my church, I should give it to that family before I go out and give it to a charity or a homeless person. Consider that. God says that directly. If, there, if your brother and sister has need, be prepared to fill it. Show hospitality. Um, and then obviously we serve unbelievers in a variety of ways. Sometimes that's in evangelism and sharing truth. Sometimes that's in physical needs. But something that I think is really important that our modern culture has really not focused on enough is that God is very clear. Christ is very clear that we should not be yoked or in partnership with unbelievers. How many Christians do you know that are financially or relationally yoked to unbelievers? That is a direct contradiction to God's word. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. A yoking, uh, the, 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 the f- factual, practical application of the word yoke was when, to, was when a, um, a, I want to say cattle, that's not the right word, a yak, a cow, a donkey, whatever. It's the uh, ring that was put around their neck that attached them to a burden, attached them to a wagon uh, or a sled or something that they were pulling. So the 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 work that's involved in that is to uh, forward this thing, right? And Christ is saying, and, and Paul is saying, don't be yoked to unbelievers. So yoking is a connection that creates a partnership. And he says specifically, what partnership does God have with Satan? You need to think about that. This does not just apply to marriage. It does absolutely apply to marriage. But it doesn't just apply to that. It's the idea that if you are taking on responsibility, taking on partnership, taking on um, connection, being aligned with, being in shared responsibility for, it should not be with unbelievers. Why? Because their priorities are different. If they don't know God, they are not in any way, not even just in the broken way that we who know him are, they are not in any way giving or serving or acting or living or loving in a way that honors God. Romans 8, if you don't know Christ, you cannot please God. Cannot. Definitive. I don't care how kind a person is. I don't care how much money they give. I don't care how frequently they provide something to somebody else. Those actions do not please God when that person does not know Jesus. Read it for yourself. So when we are prioritizing what we do, yes, absolutely, evangelism has to be a form of service. And you know God is honored by that. But don't allow your partnerships, your responsibilities, your decisions to give you a greater uh, burden to an unbeliever than to a believer. Take care of God's children first. 
if you have something to give, make sure that that need is not within your own body of brothers and sisters before you take it out into the world. If you have people calling on you for help, and one of them is a brother or sister and one is not, give to the brother or sister first. Or if you are confident, because here's the other thing, some of this, some of this, we just have to leave to God's discernment. Let's say, um, I know there's a fundraiser at my school. My school's a Christian school, but they allow non-Christians to attend. And I've got $10 to sponsor a kid in it. And my friend who's not a believer and my friend who is a believer both have children that need this. Now, of course, I could split it, but let's just say I can't. Let's say you have to give 10. So I can go to the Christian friend and describe the situation, say, hey, I really want to give this for you guys. But there's also this opportunity over here. What do you think? And if they say, no, 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 go give it to them, make that connection, be that relationship, great. We've prioritized the family, but now we have another need we can meet. But what if her, his or her son is really discouraged and really um, needing uplifting? Give it to the one who's in the church. Prioritize God's people. Same, same conflict, same drive. If my husband has asked me to be home on Wednesday evening and a friend tells me they've got a really bad problem and they really need to talk to me about it and can we get together Wednesday evening? My priority is my husband. So I go to him and I say, here's the situation. What do you think? What would be the best thing to do? And he says, no, 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 it's fine. Go talk to them. We can do our thing Thursday. Great. Now I can do both. But if he says, no, we said we were going to do this. Let's make the commitment. See if you can do something else with her. Then, then I should do that. Part of the issue with conflicting uh, demands on our time or energy often has to do with what we want. Often, if I'm with my husband... It's either more mundane or maybe he's irritated me that day. Or maybe, you know, I just know that that I haven't done it. I haven't, you know, I, I've been letting him down lately. So spending FaceTime with him feels a little Ugh, because I know that I'm not doing the best that I can do. And I've and I've let him down. I've made him feel bad. And that makes me feel bad about myself. It'd be way more fun to go out with my friend who who needs me and who looks up to me. That's going to be a lot more fulfilling for me personally than kind of facing my own weaknesses with my husband or my son or my sister or whatever. A lot of times we use God's name to uh, allow us to pick and choose uh, what's needed. But also there are times, there are absolutely times when God brings an opportunity to serve a person or to be there for somebody. Now, if my friend calls me and says her husband just died, there's absolutely no way that my husband's going to go, no, 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 you should, you should wait and have our date night first. There's clearly an element of crisis involved, an element of urgency. Like, don't throw common sense out the window. I think part of the problem is that people want black and white rules that apply across the board. You have to prioritize need and you have to prioritize relationship. So if both the needs are the same, which relationship should take priority? But if one need is very clearly more urgent or more needed than the other, obviously the more needful thing should get met. God's not asking you to check your brain at the door. But don't misunderstand me. I see in ministry all the time, all the time, people who use God's name or God's work to justify negligence towards people that are too hard or 
uh, they, they choose ministry because it makes them feel good about themselves or they choose service because it makes it feel good about themselves rather than looking at what has God actually put in my sphere, who is here. We somehow have come to believe that the service we give to our family or the service we give to our children or our spouses doesn't matter as much to God as the service that we would give at church on Thursday night or through the uh, homeless ministry or whatever. Don't let yourself be deceived. I know people that I know will stand before God and recognize or be, be made to recognize that they neglected and dismissed the responsibility, the priority responsibility God gave them towards the, the people closest to them. And he will be the one to tell them, you should not have given that time and energy to those people. I had other people who could do that. I gave these people to you and you ignored them in my name. If you want to see that in principle, um, James 2, 15 and 16 says that uh, if you say to your family, uh, I see you have need, but I can't give you that because I've dedicated that to God. Um, now, this is talking in financial or practical sense, but the principle is there. If I tell somebody that I can help who is in my family, for, for example, my dad. If I tell my dad, well, I know you needed me to do that thing, but I can't because um, I told God I was going to do that thing for this other person. God says that is in denial of him. The relationships we've been given, the family we've been given, the spouses we've been given, they should be seen as God's assignment first. And it's the rest of the world, including the church, that should get our leftovers. So my rule of thumb is my best should go to my family and the rest should go elsewhere. Now, am I always good at that? No. And it definitely, it's difficult when it comes to things like work. Um, and because I work uh, from home and, and it's paid work, you know, there, it can get really cloudy sometimes. So don't, don't hear me saying I've got this all down. What I do know uh, with absolute certainty is that God has made his priorities clear but it is a matter of learning to apply them. Um, he also tells us not to prioritize wealth or fame over poverty or lack of importance. Uh, that's in James 2 as well, verses 2 to 9. And that's something that I see the church very, very guilty of. If somebody prominent walks into your church and gets treated differently in any way to a random visitor, you are in contradiction with scripture. Our service should be, in terms of its uh, authenticity and uh, enthusiasm, it should be the same no matter who's showing up to receive it. So I shouldn't uh, be more excited about serving my pastor than I am about serving the awkward girl who sits at the back and is very needy. Do you see what I mean? When we give something to someone, God values the love offered, not who it's being offered to. Does that make sense to you? You can offer love. You can offer forgiveness. You can offer service. When God looks at you and the service that you're offering, what he's measuring is your heart in it, not who it's, who's receiving it. And not even their response to how they're receiving it. You can offer all kinds of godly things to people and they can spit on you for it. God will still reward you. You did the right thing, whether they heard it or understood it or not. This is probably the hardest one. I believe it would be an accurate scriptural interpretation that we should value the needs of our enemies over ourselves. 
Um, quick reference would be Matthew 5, verses 38 to 48. The reason that's hard is because our enemies are people who hurt us. They're people who disagree with us. They're people who actively work against us. And I am told by God to prioritize their needs over my own. That gets very, very challenging when it's somebody who's taking advantage or um, being malicious or just downright selfish. Uh, the thing the thing that I would say is that loving someone, which is what that passage is talking about, loving an enemy more than the people that you, you know, basically at the, at the end, he makes the comparison. Look, anybody loves the people they love. If you like someone, if you care about them, of course you love them. But his point is everybody can do that, whether they know God or not. We should be different. We should be better. And that means we love, genuinely love. That's how that passage begins. Don't pretend to love, actually love your enemies. But here's the kicker, and this is what the next video is going to be about. How we define love is really important, whether it's applied here in service and dying to self, or whether it's applied in the idea of contributing to somebody's life as in loving an enemy or loving a neighbor. How we define love is what will be the difference between uh, overstepping health and, and, and spiritual wisdom or not. So I'm going to get into that more in depth in the next video, but I just want to put to you if you are in a place where you feel like you are being bled dry by somebody or something, service uh, is meant to be an act of love for God, right? Service is something we do for others out of love for God. God's love, which we're going to get into in more depth, is always, always for the best for someone. If somebody, here's a, here's a, here's an extreme example, but the culture tells you that loving somebody is giving them what they want where it's within your power, right? God says loving somebody is giving them what they need or what's best for them, regardless. So, for example, if an addict comes to me and says, I'm going to lose my house, I need money, and I know that they have just spent $300 buying whatever it is that they're addicted to, giving them what they want wouldn't be an act of love. It would be feeding something in them that is harming them. God will not see me enabling an addict as an act of love. The addict will, but God will not. Loving an addict is telling them no. It's a healthy boundary. And that's what we're going to get into in more depth. But this is what I want to tell you in terms of service, in terms of dying to self, risking or being willing to say or do things or not do things that people will disapprove of or disagree with is a godly way to serve. If my church comes to me and asks me to do something that I know will cause my family to feel resentful and as if they have lost out. It is the right thing for me to say no. If somebody comes to me and all they want is emotional support and emotional empathy and sympathy and they want me to feed their emotion and they want me to tell them that they're right to feel offended and they want me to tell them that they don't deserve the problem and they don't want to hear the wisdom of God, it is right for me to say no. They won't feel loved 
in that moment, but you are loving them. You're doing what is best for them, whether they appreciate it or not. And by the way, that's how God acts with us. He gives us what is best for us, whether we appreciate it or not. So be very careful how you define love and service. It does not mean catering to the whims of people. It means providing needs, providing hospitality, providing support, sharing burdens, being willing to sacrifice time or energy or emotion or resources for the good of somebody else. And when you look at things that way, it starts to shift. And what you'll start to see is some of these people that I feel drained by, it's actually because I'm being pulled into doing things for them that aren't good. So the God's not in that. The Holy Spirit is not fueling you to enable an addict. He is absolutely not. So that's one of the reasons you're getting so drained or so anxious or so tired is because the Holy Spirit isn't in it with you. You're doing it in your own effort. You're doing it either to please them or to please your own sense of being a good person or a nice person or a loving person. Ask God in every opportunity, what is the best thing for this person in this moment? Be willing to hear that it's not you. Because I'll tell you, lastly, the thing that Satan corrupts in people that God has made for service is that they start to put their value in how much service they do. And it's a really slippery slope. Be generous, give cheerfully, serve others, but not in the way that, that is driven out of being able to point at yourself and say, see, I'm a good person. If that's what's driving you to service, it has nothing to do with God. I hope that's helpful. I'm going to talk about love and boundaries in the next one. I'll see you there.